And all I want to do Is lay it all down Pour it all out at your feet Well, for the month of August, we're going to focus for four weeks on our vision statement as a church and what that means to us. If you're new to the church, about a year ago, we went through the process of re-examining our vision as a church, and we look back at how God has made us, what, what's been um, our kind of a unique footprint in this community, and where God wants to take us for the future. And we put those two together into a, a vision statement. One of the things that's very apparent, you've probably already seen it in our church, we are a congregation of broken people. I mean, in all of our classes that, that deal with broken issues, grief share, divorce care, a healing journey, Um, Running with Horses, Celebrate Recovery, Financial Peace University, Re-Engage. It's about helping people uh, bring together those broken pieces in their life and finding help from God to put it back together. And we've seen marriages heal. We've seen individuals overcome addictions. We've seen people leave behind the griefs and the hurts from the past or broken, um, destructive habits in their lives. And we've seen God put them back together and make them whole. And what God does is make us a vessel that then can be used by Him. And we have a purpose to serve Him, to be that vessel to take God's love and grace to other people who are also broken so they can receive the same kind of healing. And so our vision statement is simply this, that God is transforming broken people into relentless loving servants of Jesus Christ. And you may find yourself at, at some place along that spectrum. You may be a person who's coming today and you're broken, you're hurting, you're wounded. Maybe it's something that, that you've done to yourself. Maybe it's something someone's done to you, but, but you feel very broken. Others here have, uh, have come in this door. It may be at a place where, hey, I'm healed up from that. I'm ready to do something for the Lord. I want to be used by God. I want to be one of those vessels. And God doesn't pick the polished and the perfect and the all put together. God takes the kind of neglected, the cast-offs, the, the ones who society might reject, And God raises them up, fills them with the Spirit, and then uses them to make a huge impact in the lives of others. And probably most of us feel somewhere in the middle there. We still have some broken areas in our life that God's healing up, but at the same time, we're being used by Him in service. And today, I want to focus specifically on an area of brokenness, both this week and next week. But today, specifically on the area of marriage, because I've watched over the last few years since COVID hit of what the pandemic did to our marriages. It was really hard on marriages. Some marriages grew and flourished during it, but a majority really struggled during the pandemic. And one of the reasons why is because we lost our routines. I mean, the routine of leaving for work, going to school, uh, enjoying a life outside the home, coming back together, and then, and then rejoining one another. And so for a long period of time, kids were learning at home. I mean, they were having school on a computer at home. And many of us adults who had jobs were doing work remotely, so everybody was in the home 24-7. Now, we love each other. We should love our families. But honestly, when you're with one another for that long a time, you kind of get tired of each other. You need a break. You need, you need a life outside of the family. And we didn't have one. Everything was shut down. There, other than going on a hike, there wasn't much you could do. And so well, we were in the house. We were watching movies. We were, we were eating together, constantly together. It was like there's no break. One day seems just very much like the next day. That seems like the next day. It's like Groundhog Day every single day. I mean, think about it. The way we're getting back now is, is we go off and do our things, we come back, and we can ask one another, how are you doing? How was your day? You didn't do that during COVID because you watched each other during the day. And just, I know what you've done all day. I'm not going to ask you how you're doing because I'm not very happy either. We're getting on each other's nerves. We're not used to being together this long. Even couples who love each other and love being together says, you know, you're kind of invading my space. I need a break from you. And so it was really hard to have that. And then on top of that was all these other pressures, you know, financial pressures and health issues, and where we stood in regards to vaccines and masks and social distancing and all these sorts of things, pressures from our families, our extended family. All of a sudden, family members were saying like, hey, we're not going to come and see you this year because of COVID, or you can't come and see the kids until we get over this. And you go, what? We're family. And we couldn't deal with those sorts of things. It's very hard. We lost our social networks. Couldn't go to the gym anymore, couldn't be part of the bowling league or the softball team, couldn't go to the club anymore. Uh, We we couldn't even for a while go to church anymore, or we we were doing church online. We lost our social circles, and so all this pressure just to handle it by ourselves got to be enormous, and then you add that to marriage. See, marriage is hard already. I mean, think about it. The odds from the beginning are stacked up against marriage. You take a broken man, put him together with a broken woman, stick them in a marriage and say, okay, make this thing work. It's like, no way. It's a miracle any marriage works. 
I mean, it's so hard. And then you put all these pressures from the outside world and the devil and all that in there. It says, man, it is like a disaster waiting to happen. But God loves marriage. And somehow God takes two people that are broken and through his grace heals them kind of through each other. And it begins this, this beautiful thing that is so wonderful that God says, now that's what your relationship with me is like. It's like a marriage. It's like two people coming together and learning how to, how to make their lives blend. And I know some of you went through COVID and your marriage isn't quite the same and, and, and things were exposed. I, I, I don't blame it on the pandemic. I don't think the pandemic necessarily caused marriage issues, but it did reveal marriage issues. It revealed that there's a, we've got a crack there. We got something that's not working quite right. Maybe it's our communication. Maybe it's our, our uh, sexual expressions or our romance or, or maybe it's how we're parenting or maybe it's our spiritual lives. There are a lot of cracks. And now we're recognized like, God, what do we do? Well, we as a church are committed to helping you bring God into your marriage and make it one of those beautiful parts of your life. I look over my life and it truly is marriage. When it goes well, is one of the most beautiful things in my life. And I think you would agree too. It's wonderful to go through life and have a companion to go through life and share all these experiences together. But when it's not going well, it's like hell on earth. It's very difficult. It's painful. And some of you find yourself in a difficult spot. Maybe you've recognized some of those cracks in your marriage. And you go, Pastor, I don't know what to do. We're going to cover a lot of that today of of what you can do. But I want to urge you to, to let your church come along beside you and help you. Maybe you're the one in your marriage that says, I'm the only one that wants to make it work. I'm the one that's trying to hold it together. I want to encourage you, sometimes it just takes one to start the process, but it has to have at least one to do that. And so we're here to help you. And I'm just going to ask you if you'd be open to listen today to God's word and these six things we'll look at today, six ways our marriages get cracked, what we can do about them, and and allow God to speak to you because I believe there's at least one of those areas where you'll say, "Uh uh-oh, that's something I need to work on because that's starting to show in our marriage. So, Father, we just come before you humbly today asking you to speak into our lives. We want our marriage to glorify you. We want our marriages to be good. We want our marriages to be a a source of blessing in not only our lives, but our spouse's lives and our kids' lives. And, Father, I pray that the next generation as they rise up will look to us and look, look to those of us who are living in marriage and say, I want what mom and dad or grandpa and grandpa have. Because I know it's not perfect, but it's beautiful. Help us to model to them what you meant when you created this special gift called marriage. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, let's look at these six areas. There's six different ways our marriages get cracked and what we can do about it. Number one, it gets cracked when we don't invest in the marriage. Do you know how much it costs today to have a wedding? A couple thousand dollars? Ten thousand dollars? You know what the average average cost of a wedding across America is? Over $22,000. In fact, there's a website just for marriages, and they surveyed 1,500 of the couples uh, uh, that are connected to their website. They found the average for those couples was $28,000. It's a, it's a lot of money to invest in a wedding, and weddings nowadays are like huge productions. I mean, you've got an ensemble of characters, you've got all kinds of beautiful clothes, you've got a wonderful venue, decorations, the finest of food, maybe a band, a great photographer, videographer, there's the honeymoon, all those things wrapped into this big event called the wedding. Now, I think weddings are worth celebrating. I, I, I'm not opposed at all investing a lot of money in a wedding because it's one of those rare events in your life. Hopefully you do it one time and you get married and it's, it's a launch into this beautiful future together. I, I think it's worth as long as you can afford it. Yeah, splurge on it. Make it a memorable time. But here's the problem. I meet with couples sometimes who want to get married and I said, you know what? We want you to have a great wedding. We really do. But we want you to have a better marriage. And so often we invest so much money, time and energy into that one day. And, and actually it's just a few hours of one day And then we coast after that and wonder why our marriage isn't going well. But I believe if we give the same kind of attention, focus, and investment of time, energy, and money into keeping our marriage going, it would would be this, this continual source of happiness. But what happens is we think, well, we made the commitment, we launch, and it's like rocket fuel. It's going to carry us the rest of our lives. It doesn't do that. In fact, a lot of that emotion, sad to say, starts to wear off. And you get trapped in the routine. Work. Sickness, bills, chores, kids. As much as we love kids, pretty soon when they come into the home, and they they are now the center of attention. 
They dominate everything. You know, everything you know, centers around the kids. They want to sleep in your bed, they get to sleep there. They want your attention, you better pick them up. I mean, they all of a sudden replace mom or dad as a priority. And we've watched it happen in our own families that the kid dominates. And here's the danger. Your family needs you to keep the marriage the priority. Julie and I learned that early on that if you don't keep the marriage a priority, your kids will sense that. And you know, the, the kids actually, they don't really care in a sense of they want your attention, but they really do want mom and dad to have a strong marriage because your, your relationship filters down to the rest of the family. And the more you take care of your marriage, the better it is for your kids, even though they may grump about it and, and they may want to be with you all the time and they may, may want to come in between you and your spouse. Sometimes you have to say, hey, I married your mother, not you. I married your father, not you. You need to leave us alone right now because we're having alone time. It's okay to do that. In fact, here's a a verse from the very beginning when God brought Adam and Eve together. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, my, My Bible, the English Standard Version says they shall hold fast. Some of your Bibles say they will cleave. Cleave, which is an interesting word because cleave can mean to separate and it can mean to adhere together, like opposite meanings. But it actually means to adhere together, to glue together. That somehow God takes two people and, and physically it's a picture of what's happened emotionally, spiritually. Two people connecting as one. And in so many ways we share life together as a couple. Now it's a lifelong process of adhering to one another. It doesn't happen just instantly. It's like the door's open now, the glue's been poured, now it's going to take some time for it to set. But when that glue sets, man, it is, it is firm. The two become one. It, it's like laminated wood. You know, laminated wood is stronger than, than actually natural wood because you take two pieces of wood and what you do is you put this board this way, the grain goes this way. You take another board, you lay it this way, the grain goes that way. You glue them together and two become stronger than one. It's like the different grain actually strengthens it because cracks form along the grain. And when you got it both ways, it's like, okay, can't crack any anyway because they hold each other together. That's why when you marry someone, it's like you don't marry someone who's just like you, who has the same grain pattern as you. You marry someone who has differences, and it might be that one's an introvert, one's an extrovert, one's a spender, one's a saver, saver. one's a disciplinarian, one's a little more playful with the kids. I mean, you you notice that in your own marriage, like, yes, there's some things you're very compatible, but there's other areas where God says, I'm going to balance you because you don't want someone just like you. It'll be disaster. I'll bring someone else, and I'll put you two together, and then I'll glue you together. And you know what happens if you try to tear that, that um, seam apart? You try to, to tear something that's been glued to something else apart? You cannot get a clean break. If you tear this apart, this will rip something out of this board. Which is why when you're married to someone and you've, you've bonded with them, that when one of those persons dies, it's like part of me was taken with them. Yes, you, there is part of you gone with them. And you will hurt forever. And that's the cost. That's the price of getting married is you cannot get a clean break. We are one. We're not just two that live together. We become one. And that's God's desire. And if you're going to be um, one, you have to have time for each other. This is the solution. Prioritize time together. Prioritize it. Henry Cloud is a great book. I'm actually going to reference this book a few times because there are some great quotes in the book. But he says in Boundaries in Marriage, The reality is that marriage is only as good as the investment people make in it. God has constructed life so that we are always either going forward into the growth process or backing away from it. We can't stay the same. And marriage reflects this reality. You've got to make time to make each other priority. Kids can't can't usurp that role of your spouse. You've got to take time in the day to say like, hey, this time of the day is for mom and me or for me and your dad. It could be after the kids go to bed, but it could be before, but this is our time. Or this is the time we go in the bedroom and close the door. There's time every week where maybe you and your spouse go out on a date or go do something that's just to you guys. It's so important that there are times where you actually get away on a vacation for just the two of you. Now, I've heard from several couples this year who said, hey, we went on a cruise this year. We did something together and just got away without the kids. It's okay. You're not a bad parent to do that. You're actually a good parent to do that because you're modeling for your kids what you want them to do with their spouse. 
Keep the marriage a priority. A healthy marriage will bless the entire family. Make time for each other. Another way our relationship gets cracked in marriage is we put self above our spouse. Now, this principle in Scripture that I'm going to read actually isn't written specifically for marriage, but it definitely applies to marriage, but it applies actually to any kind of relationship. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Care about others. Now, it doesn't say ignore your own needs or interests. He just says, look not only to your own, meaning you, you need to be mindful of the interests of others. See, I've actually seen some moms, now dads might do this, but moms are more prone to do this, is they lose themselves for their family. They actually become martyrs. Like, it's never going to be about me. It's never, about, it's never going to be about that I get that piece of dessert or I get time for me. I'm always giving, 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 giving. And the danger is you're not even paying attention to your own needs and what you need. He says, you have interest. Just don't look only to your own interests. Pay attention to those around you. If we don't do that, what happens is we become roommates in marriage. We share a house, we share finances, we sit at a table and eat, but for all practical purposes, we've just become very good roommates with maybe a little ben- extra benefits along the way. That can be a, that's not an ideal way to live in a marriage. When one goes this way and one goes the other, we need to make each other, uh, we need to take care of each other and each other's needs. And sometimes it means that We've got to sacrifice something. If you don't want to sacrifice, don't get married. Because you have to give up something from your single life to enjoy the married life. You can't live as a single person anymore. So some of the things you did before, you can't do anymore because now my spouse or even my family is taking that piece of my life. Now, Julie and I are in a good stage because we're empty nesters. But when we have the grandkids over, it's much like when we were parents. You know how you come home and you're tired, just want to rest, mostly spent. I just want to sit in front of a TV and do this. I just want to take a nap. I just want to surf the web. And then I hear this little voice from a four-year-old saying, can you play with me? I go, no, I really don't want to play with a four-year-old right now. Yeah, I can. And in my mind, I'm telling myself, you know what, this little bit of time, it may only be 15 minutes, it may be 30 minutes max, but if I could just spend a little bit of time getting out of my comfort zone, giving up my needs for my four-year-old's needs, that four-year-old's going to remember that. It's going to make an impression that, that years later I won't get a chance to make. Remember that song, Cats in the Cradle? I know it's, not, it's an old song, but the whole point of that song was... When you miss those opportunities with your kids when you're young, you're not going to get them later when they're old. They're not going to turn to you because you didn't give them time when they were little. And so, so yeah, you've got to sacrifice. That's what Jesus did for us. He sacrificed himself for the benefit of others. And husbands, we are called to be like Christ. It says in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And what did he do to show it? He gave himself up for her. Guys, we can be pretty selfish you know, I've, I've got my life and my work and my hunting trips and my shows and my football games and my boys. Okay, well, what are you giving up for your marriage? What have you sacrificed and said no to to put your marriage first and the needs of your spouse? You've got to know your mate's needs. That's what Jesus did. He met needs. He, he met the needs of his church, his bride, her need of forgiveness, her need of grace, her need of truth, her need of eternal life, her need of hope. That's what Jesus gives all of us. He says, husbands, love your wives like that. Know what she needs. Give it to her. Know your mate's needs. Adjust your schedule so that her needs are met. All through my life, now this, is, this isn't true from everyone, but in my, my career, it has been in some of your careers too, that, that our wives have stepped back and say, you pursue your career, I'll follow you. You know, there are times where my wife feels like, my whole life's been about you and your agenda. When does it get to be about mine? And there are times I have to just pause and say, hey, our whole life can't be about church. Our whole life can't be about ministry and what I'm doing. I need to get out of my world sometimes and just say, hey, what about you? What about your desires? What are your needs? What do you want to accomplish in life? We've got to take an effort to do that. Don't put yourself above your spouse. Thirdly, here's, this can crack a marriage. We talk, but we don't communicate. We talk, but don't communicate. Our greatest need is to understand one another. And sometimes we think that talking is understanding, but it's not. You can actually talk to each other 
and never understand because while this person's talking, this person's thinking about how they're going to talk back to that person when they stop talking. We actually don't pause to listen. And listening goes way to the heart because oftentimes when we hear someone talk, our, our natural response is, okay, I'll help you fix that. You got a problem? I'm, I'm the fix-it man. I'm the fix-it woman. So a husband comes home from work and says, hey, I'm having trouble with my boss. Or I've got the, it's this employee, he's doing this. And your wife says, oh, here's what you need to do. This, this, and that. That'll fix it. And, uh, and all you want her to, to, to do is acknowledge that you're struggling, that you're going through this that's caused a lot of stress in your life. Or she comes to you and says, I've had trouble with this girlfriend of mine, or I'm having trouble with the kids. And, and you say, well, yeah, here's what you need to do. Just start doing this. I mean, I'll just tell you this. If your wife says, I don't feel good about myself and my, the way I look and my weight, you got, I, I can fix it, honey. I'll go get you a treadmill. I'll tell you from personal experience, it does not work. Don't do that. Bad move. She, she wants affirmation. She wants understanding. We want, we want someone who's tuned in to know, like, I get what you're going through. Man, that's got to be hard. And it's difficult, and, and I'm here with you. They don't, they don't want you to fix anything. And husbands, we're probably the worst cult, culprits at that, and that's why I think Scripture specifically addresses us as men. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Understand your wives. Tune into her heart. Don't try to fix her. Now, he calls her in this passage the weaker vessel. And I know some people will say, like, well, that's offensive to me. Women aren't weaker. And, and truly, in many ways, women, women are tough. In fact, I've, I've known many women much tougher than men. This is not about who's tougher. It's about the physical structure of our bodies. And there is no doubt that in most cases, a, a man's body is sturdier than a woman's body, is, is heavier, is <laughs> Put, put, a, put 11 men on a football team on one side, put 11 women on the other side, and I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of people on this side injured when the game's done. It, it, our, our society has gone crazy thinking men and women are just the same, exactly the same with different um, sexual parts. It's not. We're not the same. God did not make us the same physically, did not make us the same on the inside either. We're different. But, but he tells men, be understanding, be gentle with your wife. Don't bully her. Don't intimidate her. Be understanding. And to be understanding, you have to work at listening. James 1.19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Here's what talking does. We feel like, well, we're talking. Um, the focus is on the words. I'm thinking what I'm going to say, and we're going to talk. Oh, yes, you better believe it. We're going to talk. And, but communication is not focused on the words we're going to say. It's what do you want to accomplish by this conversation? Do you want us to unite? Do you want us to resolve this issue? Do you want us to love each other more? Because if that's the goal, you communicate a lot differently. You talk to one another a lot differently. In fact, did you know that words are only about 7 to 10% of the conversation? That things like your, your eyes your facial expressions, your tone of voice, how you position your body, all communicate that you want to engage in communication. If you're doing this and rolling your eyes saying, we're talking, I know, we're talking, that's not, that's not communication. But if you sit close enough to say, honey, tell me, tell me how you're feeling. Oh my goodness. Is that what's going on? I didn't know that. Show it with the seriousness of your eyes, the tone of voice, your facial expression. It's all of you engaging. That's how you get to really understand a person. And you, you've got to open your ears. And you also have to open your heart. The solution is opening both the ears and the heart. Because some of us aren't very good listeners, so we don't open our ears very well. But there's some of us who are not very good at opening the heart. So we're the kind of person that says, I'm not going to go there with that person. I'm not going to I'm not going to make myself vulnerable to my spouse, so I'm just going to hold those feelings in. And that's not helpful either. You've got to have the courage to say, okay, here, can I tell you how I'm feeling? I've held this in for a long time, but I've got to get this out there. And I know it takes trust to do that, but you can't build trust unless you first trust with something. It's like you've got to test the waters and see how the other person responds. Trust is built when you take a risk, putting your feelings out there. Open your heart, open your ears. And maybe, maybe God's telling you 
that you need to do one or the other in a better way to improve the level of your communication. Fourthly, we pursue happiness over faithfulness. That's, that can lead to cracks in a marriage, pursuing happiness over faithfulness. Again, Henry Cloud in his book on boundaries and marriage says, people who always want to be happy and pursue it above all else are some of the most miserable people in the world. Happiness can be part of marriage, but it's not the supreme goal. Uh, we had a neighbor once. Julie and I had this neighbor. They, they shared a patio home with us. They were right next door to us. Young, beautiful couple, and they were married for several years. They seemed like they had it all together. Just, just adorable couple. And then we found out that she divorced. And when I asked the husband, like, what happened? He said, you know, she just felt like she married too young, and she missed out on those years of just running around with her friends, dating and all that, and she wanted to recapture her younger years. I said, really? Yeah, she just wanted to be happy. I said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. People make crazy decisions in their marriage seeking simply to be happy. And, and what, what we lead to is sometimes we start to flirt with someone, say, I'm not, I'm not happy in my marriage, and I don't want to get divorced, but maybe I can find an, uh, an outlet to find some happiness. So I'm just going to flirt a little bit, or, you know, I've got some magazines, or videos I like to watch and just meets a need, may fulfill something in me, or, or maybe we get on some, some risque places on phone chatting and online, or, or maybe we've experimented with casual encounters. Did you know there's actually a website called Ashley Madison? It's a very sophisticated website. It's, for, it's primarily targeted at married couples for a married person to find a uh, a discreet relationship outside the marriage. In fact, here's Ashley Madison's motto. Life is short, have an affair. And you may think, well, that's sure a strange group. Yes, they have 60 million members. 60 million members. I can guarantee you there's thousands right here in Colorado Springs. Married people who say, I'm not happy in my marriage. I'm finding my happiness outside my marriage, but I'm faithful in my marriage. Well, you can't be... You can't have it both ways. And I know I looked on their website and they differentiate between um, faithfulness and an affair and, and adultery. They, they say you, you, can, you can have a physical relationship with someone and yet be faithful to your spouse because, because one's just physical, just physical. It's like going to a buffet and you know, I'm just having sex with someone, nothing more than that. But in the Bible... Sex can't be set apart as just a physical thing. It's a spiritual, emotional thing. In fact, Paul says in Corinthians that if you, if you have sex with a prostitute, you're actually becoming one with her. That's right. There's a part of you that you're giving to her. It's like the glue that laminates you two together. It's meant just for the married couple. And so when you start dabbling outside in all these things, whether it's visual stimulation or an actual in, a relationship with someone else, it can be very dangerous in your relationship. We, we, we have to be careful not to stray. It says in Malachi, so guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Now, in the Old Testament, the word adultery is used for the Israelites when they worship other gods. Like if they worship Baal, and then they, they, but they were Israelites, God says, you, you've committed spiritual adultery. It's not physical, spiritual, spiritual adultery. Can you imagine if, if the Israelites said to God, well, God, uh, I just have more fun over there with Baal but I'll be back in church on Sunday for you. And that's kind of what this is. Like, yes, I, I'm going to be committed to my spouse, but I'm going to give myself away during the week to someone else. And that's not faithfulness. We have to really invest ourselves with stoking the fire that we have in our own backyard. Only feed your own marriage fire. I love, again, Proverbs has so much wisdom for life. But in Proverbs chapter 5, it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely, dear, a graceful doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. You have a fountain. You have a cistern. Pay attention to that one. It takes work. We, we change over years. Uh, the, the emotions of teenage years or young adult years start to fade off. The hormones change. The body looks different. But we, we don't have the same drive and desires over the course of time. But, but that doesn't mean you can't love each other with passion. You've got to work at it. You've got to spend time. But if you're not investing in your own marriage, if you're not adding coals to your fire, no wonder why that's getting cooler. You're starting fires out here and it's dangerous. It's going to destroy your marriage. Focus on your happiness being only in your own marriage. 
Here's a fifth way our marriages get cracked. We tolerate destructive patterns. Again, in, in Henry Cloud's book on boundaries, he basically says that we put guardrails in our lives that say, I will accept this behavior and there's certain behaviors I won't tolerate anymore. That's a boundary. You're not going to abuse me. See, many of us continue to tolerate toxic behaviors in our marriage and just say like, I really wish he would change or I really wish she would stop doing that. Um, but it never changes. And so we complain to our friends. We complain to our parents. Uh, we even complain to our kids about our spouse, but we never actually see life change. I worked with a woman like that. She was a volunteer at my old church. She would come in two days a week and she would tell me about her husband being an alcoholic. And she said, yeah, you know, um, he was drinking last night and had too much and came home and was loud and abusive and and threw things, or was mean to me. But then this morning, when I confronted him, he got very tearful, said he was so, so sorry. He loves me. He'll never do it again. But then a month later, it would happen again. And they'd go through the same routine. She would confront him. He would be so remorseful, so pitiful. He would say, honey, I love you. I don't want to lose you. I promise I'll change. And then a month later, it happened again. I mean, it happened so many times. I got tired of hearing about it. But then one day she came in and she said, uh, Pastor Darren, she said last night he was drinking. And I said, this is enough. This is enough. From this point forward, you, are, you choose me or that bottle. And you do not get both. And I want you to tell me which one you want. Because if you choose me, there'll be no more drinking in this house. And guess what happened? He stopped drinking. Why? Because she finally put her boundary there. See, a lot of times we just keep hoping and we, and we believe someone when, with the tears of repentance of wanting to change, but they don't have the willpower to change. But when they come to the place where they realize they're going to lose something significant, they finally say, okay, now I'll change. You know, it could be alcohol, it could be pornography, it could be drugs, it could be gambling, it could be a number of things. But, but if you keep tolerating your spouse's problem behavior, you become the problem. You can no longer keep blaming them because the blame now comes to you for, keep, for continuing to tolerate it. That's your choice. You don't have to put boundaries on those destructive patterns. There's a time in Paul's life where he actually confronts another apostle. Now, they're not married, but they're friends. But it says here in the, the book of Galatians, but when Cephas, that's uh, Peter's name, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. What Peter was doing was, he was saying like, oh, God loves the Gentiles. Oh, all you Gentiles, God loves you. But then when all the Jews came around, he goes, mm, I'm with you guys, not with them. But I don't know about them. I'm a good Jew. And, and Paul just says, come on, Peter. You know the gospel. Quit, quit, quit acting both ways. It's hypocritical. God wants you to love the Gentiles. Let your Jewish friends know God loves the Gentiles. He, he says, we can't tolerate that anymore. And there's something going on in your own family life that you finally say, like, hey, we're not going to do that anymore. You have to address the big issues. If there's a big issue that's fracturing your marriage, you've got to address it. Address the big issues. Don't continue to put up with it. And then here's the sixth one, the sixth way. There's a lot of other ways, but these are six major ways that our marriages get cracked. We're too proud to get help. We're too proud. Because we think like, everyone knows how to have a great marriage. No, they don't. I, I don't think anybody knows how to have a great marriage. Because we're all struggling. We're all working at it. Even, even the people who are counselors. I thought Dr. Phil had a great marriage. He's divorced. I mean, even the people you think got it together don't have it all together. Don't give the impression. Get help. Get, get a circle of people around you, other couples, uh, wise mentors, older people, um, professional people. Uh, understand what resources you have available through videos, through books, through conferences. Get all the help you can. This is an important relationship. Get help. You're not going to get great at it just by yourself. You need to invest in it. And you invest by getting the help that you need. You know, Proverbs had so much wisdom, and these apply to so many areas of life, but especially marriage, where there is no guidance of people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. It says, do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. See, what happens is when you get someone else to speak into your marriage, 
If you go to somebody that's older and wiser and say, hey, my spouse and I are struggling in this area, they will give you typically unbiased feedback. They might even tell you ways you are contributing to the problem that you're not even aware of. And we need people to speak into our lives like that. It's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's a sign of wisdom. Wise people seek help. And that's why wise people take things that like churches like ours offer. We've had over 200 couples over the last several years go through a program called Reengage. For a number of years, we looked for really a good tools and good courses to take couples through. And we came across this one from another church down in Texas that we said, this is probably the best tool we've ever seen. It's a great tool. It's called Reengage. Couples come together for 16 weeks. They focus on marriage issues. They really work not so much on their spouse, but on themselves, allowing God to reshape them and help them be the better husband and the better wife. And they meet with other couples and they all share what God is teaching them. It's a great encouragement. We've seen marriages that have struggled, that, that have improved greatly. Marriages on the brink of chaos are now, have now discovered how to love each other, how to communicate, how to address these issues that maybe they never, ever addressed before. And this fall, we're offering re-engage again. But I want you to hear from some couples. You may recognize some of these faces, people who have actually been part of re-engage in the past. So watch the screen behind me as you hear them rave about what re-engage did for them. No marriage is perfect. And um, we're all sinners just trying to, you know, uh, be as Christ-like as we can. And um, it has helped me be more gracious to my lovely husband here. I can't do it all by myself. I can't bear every burden and that communicating and sharing is much easier than keeping everything inside. We loved Reengage so much we took it twice because we just scratched the surface. We, we have a blended marriage and we wanted to work through a lot of issues and we felt like we needed it again and we got so much more out of it this time than we did last time. Come in, even if there's questions or doubts, or it's a great, great curriculum to help you see what your marriage can be like. It's exciting to see other couples grow, grow in the relationship with God, grow in the relationship towards each other, grow closer together. We have couples that not necessarily have good marriages already, and that we see that they even improve, get better. Some marriages that maybe need a little help. We see improvements there as well. So it, it's, uh, it's great and exciting to see that happen. Be humble enough for some of you. Yeah, some of you have actually taken a re-engage before, and you might need a refresher. You know, it's been three years since we've offered re-engage. And it's a great way to make a, a, a marriage that's good better or a marriage that's struggling, get over that hump to say there's hope for our marriage. And so uh, and maybe you're the one of those spouses that says, I'd really like that, honey. Would you be willing to invest one semester with me in making our marriage better than it even is today.